Let's talk about airspace. Uh, so there are several different flavors of airspace. I'll start with A, alpha airspace, that is high altitude airspace. Um, so that's going to be, oh, shoot, there we go. Uh, class A airspace starts at 18,000 feet, goes up to flight level 600, and you must be on an IFR flight plan. Class Bravo, uh, class Bravo airspace is your next step down. I uh, think Bra Boeing, Busy, uh, those are your big airports. Class Charlie airspace, oh, that's class golf. Class Charlie airspace is uh, crazy airspace, like F-18s, military aircraft. Uh, so that's a step down from the busyness of class Bravo, uh, but Whidbey is a class Charlie airspace. And that's how I remember crazy aircraft like the F-18s over at Whidbey. Class Delta, I tell my son, my son is studying to be a pilot as well. Uh, class Delta for dad, that's the air, airspace that we fly out of at Payne Field, class Delta. Uh, again, a step down from Charlie, um, but still towered. And then uh, class Echo airspace, um, that is pretty much everywhere above 1,200 feet, roughly. Uh, class Golf airspace, uh, E is pretty much everywhere. And then G, go for it. It's a uh, low level airspace, uh, technically not controlled airspace. And uh, you will find like UAVs, drones in that airspace. Um, yeah. Let's go into each of these. Class A airspace, like I said is 18,000 up to flight level 600. By the way, does anybody know? Well, I'll just say it. Above class A airspace, below it is Echo, and above e uh, Alpha is Echo as well. So there's an Echo Alpha Echo sandwich. Uh, so it goes from 18,000 to 600 and includes the airspace overlying the waters within 12 nautical miles of the coast of the 48 contiguous states and Alaska. You must be on an IFR flight plan to be in class A airspace. Class B airspace, busy Boeing uh, is depicted by these solid blue lines. And this one here corresponds to SeaTac. Uh, it goes from the surface, from the surface up to 10,000 feet MSL, and it overlays the busiest airports. Uh, they are tailored sp to the specific airport. So you're never going to see two class B airspaces that look the same. Uh, you need a clearance to enter the Bravo. You must hear the words Cessna 243 at Echo. You are cleared to enter the Bravo. You can't just hear your call sign. Class Charlie airspace is depicted by these solid magenta lines. Uh, they go from the surface up to, uh, to uh, 4,000 feet, uh, 4, feet above the airport elevation, and they do require two-way radio communications. But instead of Class Bravo, where you have to hear clear to enter, if they just say 243 at Echo, your, your call sign, uh, then you are clear to enter. If they say something like aircraft calling over uh, South Camino, that means they have not acknowledged you yet, and you are not allowed to enter the Charlie. Uh, class Delta is depicted by these dashed blue lines. Don't get them confused with this VOR ring here. That's something else entirely. We'll cover that later. But this dashed blue ring depicts Class Delta airspace. That's where I fly out of Payne Field. Uh, it goes from the surface up to 2,500 feet above the airport. And this blue box here tells you the altitude in MSL. Because Payne Field is 608 feet above sea level, then you would add 600 to 2,500 to get the altitude in MSL. You do need two-way radio, two radio communications, just like the Charlie. You got to hear a call sign to, to be allowed to enter. Then there's class Echo. There's a lot of different flavors of Echo airspace. This is essentially anything that's not classified as the previous ABC or D airspace. One of the ways you can see class echo is this dash magenta circle or lines. This tells you that it is class echo from the surface up to the next overlying airspace. So if we're looking at, if we're looking at the side here, uh, this blue starts Bravo, while this over here is echo up to 18,000 feet. So you see from the surface on the west side of this blue line, it goes up to 18,000. On the right side of this line, it goes from it goes echo up to six thousand feet, and then it becomes class Bravo because you're inside the solid blue. Uh, on the outside of this magenta line, uh, and inside these vignettes here, these uh, little wishy-washy looking things, on the inside it's seven hundred feet. That's echo. It starts at seven hundred feet and goes up to the next overlying airspace. On the outside. Uh, like over here on the outside or the hard side of these magenta vignettes, then uh, it starts at 1,200 feet AGL, and it goes up to the next overlying airspace. So this one's kind of cool because it shows you a bunch of different echo airspaces in one graphic. 
So inside the magenta circle, uh, the dashed circle, that's echo at the surface. On the outside, but inside this magenta vignette, it's 700, echo at 700. And on the outside here, it's 1200. Right? Make sense? And generally, anything above 14,500 is echo airspace, um, just in general, 14,500. Then there's class golf airspace. Again, this is technically uncontrolled airspace. So you're going to see drones and a bunch of other yahoos operating in class golf. So that's anything other than these before. And it goes from the surface up to whatever else is above it. So on the hard side of this vignette, it's surface to uh, 1,200 feet AGL. On the soft side, it's surface to 700 feet AGL. Um, yeah. And we are seven minutes away. So let's <laughs> move it along here. There's the special use airspace. I like the acronym MCPRON. He's a little prawn here. MCPRON stands for Military Operation Areas. This is airspace meant to separate military training from IFR traffic. Technically, VFR pilots can fly in MOAs, but you want to be very careful because you can bump into my brother flying those cool jets up there. So uh, check the NOTAMs and check the controlling agency to see if the MOA or the MOA is active. Then there are controlled firing areas. These are basically areas that the military might be using to blow stuff up. Uh, technically, they're supposed to stop their activity if they see you flying through them. I would still be careful. There's prohibited areas. These are den denoted by a P, something like P51. Uh, it'll tell you, hey, don't fly in here. This area is prohibited. Don't bust prohibited areas. You're going to have a bad day. Restricted areas. These are areas that may you may fly into them if you have permission, but you want to be very, very careful. Basically, don't fly into it if it's active. Uh, always talk to the controlling agency before you fly anywhere near these guys, just in case. Alert areas is just areas that say, hey, pay attention. Something unusual is happening here. It might be like parachute activity, that kind of stuff. And then warning areas, these are, uh, they start at three miles off the coast. Um, and they're just, again, to warn you that there might be some unusual activity in these areas like controlled firing or um, aerial gunnery. And then there's areas of national security. These are depicted on the charts and they say, for reasons of national security, do not fly over this. Like there are a couple in our area that uh, correspond to uh, the Naval Air Station um, and uh, military areas essentially, but don't fly over national security areas. Again, you're gonna have a bad time. Let's talk real quick about the basic VFR weather minimums. We got five minutes, so I'm just going to bypass this and go into this graphic here. Uh, basically, if you draw this triangle, it will tell you the weather minimums for all the different types of airspace. Let's start with alpha. Alpha is outside of here because alpha is IFR only. So we don't even need to worry about alpha airspace. At the top here, you've got echo and golf above 10,000 feet MSL, five miles visibility, 1,000 above, 1,000 below, one mile horizontal separation from clouds. The center triangle is Bravo, Charlie, Delta, or Echo. You need three miles visibility, 1,000, uh, 3,152, 3,000 feet visibility, 1,000 above, uh, 500 below, and 2,000 feet horizontal. Bravo is the exception. Bravo only requires you to remain clear of clouds. So three miles, Clear of, uh, clear of clouds. Gulf airspace is on the flanks. At night, it becomes 3152. In the daytime, below 1200, you need one mile and clear of clouds. Super easy. One mile clear of clouds in class Gulf. Above 1200, you need one 152. That's the one here. One mile of visibility, 1000 above, 500 below, 2000 horizontal separation. So, Let's think about that for a second. Class golf, uncontrolled airspace, basically the wild west of aviation. And you only need one mile of visibility and you just have to stay out of the clouds. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one mile of visibility. It's not very much. I've flown in six miles of visibility. And I was like, I don't know about this, right? Uh, so be careful. These are legal minimums. Make your own personal minimums to be safe. Uh, so again, Learn how to draw this. This is going to make it very easy to remember this chart of, of just words. 
Yeah. Makes sense. Again, if it doesn't make sense, tell me. How's that? Question. Okay. So unfortunately, we're not going to get into weather today. We've run out of time. I apologize. I am I did a poor job managing, managing our time today. But any questions about this or the E6B or the uh, the uh, weather or the uh, flight briefings next week? Anything at all? I had a question about airspace above uh, airports when you need confirmation to go in. Uh, are you radioing them, like asking to go in? Or are they keeping track automatically of planes in the area and they'll automatically? Great question. You have to call them. It is on. It is your responsibility to establish radio communications before you enter their airspace. So at Payne Field, actually, this is kind of blurry. Let's go back up to Payne Field, and I'm going to clear this. Uh, when you are outside of this airspace, you're going to look over here. I'm going to draw it in red so it's easier to see. Look at this information right here. This tells you the control tower is 120.2. So you call them up and say, hey, Payne Tower, Cessna 243 at Echo, we're 10 miles to the west. We'd like to come in to land. And they'll be like, Roger, uh, 3 at Echo, enter on the left downwind or whatever. They'll give you uh, instructions on how to enter. I've only been told to stay out of the Delta once. And it's because it was a super, like just a gorgeous day. And there were like 20 aircraft in the pattern. And like the controller just keeps getting calls from everybody in the area, like up here. And he's just like, all right, everybody calling uh, pain tower, stay out of the Delta. <laughs> he literally was like, everybody calling, shut up, leave me alone. Uh, and then, uh, and so we were like, okay, cool. <laughs> we'll leave that guy alone. And so after a while, it calmed down and we came back in and landed. But it was nuts how busy it was. But yeah, short answer, it is your responsibility to uh, confirm the control tower frequency. Also, you want to pick up the weather before you call them. The ATIS is the uh, weather frequency. Let them know that you've got the weather uh, so they know that you know what direction the uh, aircraft are landing, what the pattern is. Yeah, good question. Any others? Sweet. All right, I'm just going to draw. Uh, if you guys want to stick around, I'll stick around for a few more minutes to answer questions. Uh, if you're too shy to ask them while everybody's here. Otherwise, next week, it's your show. So if I show up, to, if I show up next week, I don't, I'm not going to have anything planned for you guys. I'm expecting you guys to come up with your flight plans and uh, show me what you got. And I'll, I'm excited to see what you, what you come up with. I mean, of course, I can talk about airplanes all day long, so... If nobody ends up presenting, I'll just, you know, go on a rant about how awesome airplanes are. Cool. Thank you, Monty. Yeah, I appreciate you guys sticking around. Thank you. Yep, see ya. Hey, Monty. Hey, I'm just curious, where do you uh, fly out of? I've, I've missed your uh, resume. Oh, yeah, I fly out of Payne Field but with uh, Rainier. Um, I'm also trying to start my own flight school, so we'll see how that goes. Oh, but yeah, Payne Field. Right on, man. Yeah. How about you? you? Uh, how'd you get into it? Oh, I'm, a, I'm an RPA dude. I fly drones. Oh, so nice. I'm out, uh, I actually was uh, one of the cadre for doing this actually uh the husky flying club so it's really nice. cool seeing you uh volunteer your time and hours and efforts man i i appreciate it it uh yeah of course I noticed, man that's pretty it's really cool of you thanks for uh teaching all these guys yeah I, pre I appreciate the appreciation yeah i um i know how it is when i started the flying club at uw bothell before we merged the clubs it was hard getting people to um you know to be involved like they would show up but they wouldn't volunteer to do things it was interesting. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it though. Yeah. This club's only been around for like five years, I want to say. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's really cool seeing what uh, y'all have done. So, so thank you for taking the time to, to teach all these guys. It's really cool. Yeah, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for saying that. I appreciate it. Yeah. But if uh, you ever have questions about unmanned stuff, let me know. I'll, uh, yeah, we'll do. Oh, do you have your drone certificate? Like your uh, commercial drone? 
Uh, we I fled the MQ9, so it's military only. Oh, FAA right. Doesn't like us. Yeah. So we we get our own special airspace. So it's funny when you're talking about all these like prohibited airspaces. That's like all I can fly in. Oh, <laughs> nice. Prohibited. Airspace. Yeah. That's so cool, man. Even says unmanned air- aircraft options, and we can't fly if that's not in the A distance. So that's it's pretty funny because all of my my stuff's really special. And then yeah. you're like, yeah, you could get away with doing all this and that. I'm like, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I just cry here in the corner of the tiny, the tiny corner of the gigantic uh, Nellis training range. If you know where that yeah. is, it's in Nevada. It's yeah, gigantic you... out there. We just get the corner. Now I've heard you guys get like actual flight time uh, on top of your like UAV training. Do you uh, do you get to fly like you know manned aircraft ever? Uh, so we do only out of the gate. So. Everybody that goes through Air Force aviation has to go through DOS, which is in Pueblo, Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody has to go through that. And that little gate, one of the little diamond aircraft, it's a single engine, twin seat, tiny, tiny aircraft. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you get put in that for your initial flights. And uh, the RPA guys stay the longest just because we don't ever go into a jet after that. So yeah. we all we all just get stuck. We get to so we get a little VFR. Uh, I think it's like we get ten hours or short of getting your PL, something like that. Mm. And then and we do cross countries and all that good jazz. Whereas uh, all the man guys, they stop at cross. They just hit their pattern solo and then they uh, they dip and they go to wherever their UPT training is. So they uh, right they just they uh, they get more training in, in the terms of actual flying but yeah for us right. we just uh once we're done with dos it's off to t- texas for your instrument rating which again is another one of those like your 10 hours short kind of thing it's really weird right. and then uh you go out to either holloman syracuse or march which is california new mexico or new york and then you get trained on the mq9 or you go RQ fours and they go to like California and somewhere else I forget. But I'm that's cool, man. So I went to Holloman, but yeah, man, it's a it's a we're, we're nice and special. <laughs> yeah, and it's you ever think about <laughs> what's that? You ever think about getting your private though, like your your private pilot certificate, just to like you know get some flight oh, time yeah. in uh, outside the military? Oh yeah, um, I'm actually looking to do that. Once I get back from deployment, uh, so I'll be out the door in February, and I was hoping to to get in uh, get into it when I come back in like June time frame, June July nice. time frame. But I'm also trying to get my masters. We're mm. trying to keep the MQ9 a viable platform, so it's it's a uh, so we're going into the, the Indo PACOM region, which is not where the MQ9 should be, but mm. uh, we're trying to make it. Uh, I mean, it should be his core term. It's exactly where it should be. It's just, mm. it's not where it's ever been before. There you go. Right. So, so we aren't, uh, funnily enough, we aren't like all weather. We do not like icing in the slightest and, uh, right. Yeah. Do not like the rain at all. So it's like, <laughs> if anything's wet, you're like, eh, well, it can't fly today. <laughs> yeah. So go, go, in, go to Japan is interesting because you're just, it's a uh, wet all the time (laughs) so yeah that's cool man uh so how much uh, how much time do you have you been coming to the ground sessions frequently or is this your first Uh, time very infrequently um i have hopped in a few before um it's mostly to do with timing like i Mm -hmm. sometimes i get off work at now and sometimes i get off work at like noon it just yeah Depends on the day, how much work I got to do, and uh, whether I fly because I'm uh, my squadron flight at night, and then the training squadron flies in the morning, and we mm. share the same aircraft, so they'll do the morning goes, and then we do the evening goes. So, like during the summer, uh, because it was so hot out, because it reached like uh, like hundred, I was like a hundred 
plus degrees for like I think 60 days in a row something like that um so the MQ-9 does not like hot weather same with every single aircraft ever um (laughs) but uh so we were stuck uh like launching at midnight and then landing at like 4 a.m so it's it's a pretty interesting when you get into that but now it's starting to get into like we launch at like 4 p.m land at like 10 we call it good Mm. enough there but but yeah it's it's weird and now it's starting to snow out here and stuff too I actually just went through uh, a, my first storm ever. That was pretty interesting. Ooh. Like, should we fly today? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, you could fly. It's within limits. I'm like, eh. So it's funny you're talking, talking about it's legal, but it's your own, your own yeah. standard or whatever, right? It's like, uh, yeah, no, that's real. <laughs> like, you'll get, you'll go into something legal, but it's like, can you actually, do you still have the actual skill sets to get it? to get to be safe yeah know, and to not crash into anything yeah that's actually that's really interesting do you mind like uh sharing some of your experiences i think that'd be really cool to uh you know to hear from you know somebody other than me just you know constantly regurgitating stuff uh if, if you're if you're well, willing you know no no, no worries either for you. i'm willing uh the thing is is you guys have some like you, you guys get to do a lot of actual pilot stuff you know you gotta make a lot of decisions uh that i don't get to make like i like mm. i have my airspace that is it i don't yeah. really do true i don't really do anything other than i start up an aircraft i launch it hand it over to some dude or i'll take it from some dude land it kind of thing so it's it's a little interesting yeah. i'm willing to talk about it uh just mm. let me know what to uh, what kind of you're looking for if you want stories or whatnot, but I'm, uh, I'm also fairly new. Uh, this will be my first deployment and typically deployments are really where you get your experience. Yeah, yeah and definitely. They fly you like, they fly you day in, day out. Whereas right now I'm like flying once a week. So it's just like, okay, gotcha. yeah, cool. Get a couple hours here, a couple hours there. I mean, it all adds up and you really get experience. You get good experience from it. Excuse me. But yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'd love to hear it. I mean, I think it's fascinating, but uh, I don't know if you're willing to share. We, I think it would be really cool to hear uh, what you what you've experienced. Just if nothing else, it's just a different perspective, you know. Yeah, and then you aren't scared when you hear unmanned aircraft in vicinity. You're like, <laughs> stay away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's funny. Kind of I was talking. I was talking to a buddy, uh, one of my students actually, and uh, I was telling him like, you know, a lot of people have kind of an imposter syndrome um, in aviation. It's like, oh, I'm only a student pilot or I'm only, you know, first solo, only private. And it's like, I believe that anybody, everybody in the community has a place, you know, and you should be proud of what you've done. Kind of like in the military, a lot of people will be like, oh, I was an infantry. And so they'll feel, I don't know, like an imposter. I was like, just be proud of what you're, what you are and like even uav pilots like i think they're cool and he was like you're talking about like drone quadcopter pilots i was like no like like you know air force drone pilots he's like oh that's really cool he hadn't thought about it yeah. so. it's uh the the challenge for us that i that i think a drone pilot is really cool is or at least for the lr stuff is just how how difficult it is to do it alone it's difficult in and of itself when you're with a crew and that's kind of one of the cool things that i really like about the mq9 is like i could not fly this thing without my sensor the sensor keeps mm-hmm. you honest it's literally having a co-pilot there telling you everything you're doing wrong at all times <laughs> at all phases yeah. of flight and it, it like it can really like irk you in a way where it's just like hey pilot you're 20 feet off altitude it's like Man, it's twenty feet. Come on, yeah. <laughs> Stop busting my balls here. Yeah. And you're like, like, come on, man. But like, it's true. It's like, yeah, I'm twenty feet off altitude. I need to fix it. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of one of the neat things that I I don't know uh, how you're how you guys because I know that uh, you know a lot of those, especially commercial aviation, have co-pilots and stuff like that, right? So I don't mm-hmm. exactly know how that whole thing works out, but. That's one of the things that I appreciate a lot is just having uh, somebody there telling you you're wrong all the time. It's just really humbling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
like, hey man, you're fast, you're slow. Why the why are you so high? <laughs> it's like, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the aircraft does what the aircraft does. It's a, uh, it just climbs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, most of my flying is either with an instructor or like solo, um, or as the instructor essentially. Uh, so yeah. it's very single pilot resource management kind of world where you, you're, you're, you're the guy and you have to like be aware and make, you know, corrections as you see them. And unfortunately there's nobody there yeah. to, you know, to cover you. So yeah, having a crew would be a new experience, I think, for me. Yeah. The other thing, too, is you can't feel the aircraft. You know, that's another oh, one of those yeah. weird things. Is like, you, if you don't see something with this, this happened not too long ago. Uh, there's a NQ9 that crashed simply because they didn't, they did a go around and they didn't bring the throttle up. They mm. pitched up, didn't add the power. And then they just stalled out and crashed. And so uh, it's like yeah. in the actual aircraft, you'd be like, man, I'm getting really slow. Man, oh, I'm getting some buffeting. I get the stall horn. I get, I didn't hear the engine spool up. It's like, you get none of that. You're like, your cross check yeah. is purely visual and you get nothing. And so that's another Ooh. important part of those sensors telling you, hey, you're wrong, man. Like you're getting slow. And in the crash report, like you hear the sensor. So it's just like, hey, man, we're slow. Hey, man, we're slow. Like, knock it off. We're, we're slow. Why are we slow? And the pilot didn't add the power until too late. Yeah. But it's uh, also, thank God we're, you're in a drone because nobody got hurt from it. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true, too. Yeah. Crater is a runway. An expensive drone, though, right? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, just a few million dollars. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. But hey, yeah. like I said, if you're willing to share your stories, I think they'd be fascinating for everybody else to hear. And I would love to hear them. So, uh, yeah, man. Yeah, um, if you're up for uh, it, hit me up. I should be able to next week. You do this every Monday, right? Yep. Every Monday at mm -hmm. six local. So, yeah, I, sh I should be able to make it next Monday if you're, if you're down to make that happen. Yeah. Sounds good. See you next Monday. All right. Yeah. See you, Mom. Thanks, man. Hi, Monty. Hey, how's it going? Uh, pretty good, uh, thanks. Uh, I was just like wondering really quickly. Uh, so I saw that we needed to calculate like the weight and balance for our like uh, flight plan that's coming up. And I am super confused as to like how we're even going to go about doing that. Because like, sure. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the basic calculation is weight <laughs> times arm equals your moment, right? Yep. And so if you have, let's say, uh, a pilot baggage, uh, fuel, and then the empty weight of the aircraft. Those are, you know, it's a very basic problem. So you're going to say like the pilot's 180 pounds, you've got 20 pounds of baggage, you have uh, 50 gallons of fuel, and then your empty weight is, let's say 1900 pounds. You're going to go into your pilot operating handbook. I want to say it's section six, like uh, chapter six. Um, I, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, and and you're just going to find the arm. Let's say the arm for the pilot is uh, 81 inches from the plane, from the datum. Uh, the baggage compartment is 100 inches from the datum. The fuel is six pounds per gallon. So mm -hmm. 300 pounds times whatever the, da the uh, arm is, let's say 42. And then the empty weight, they'll likely give you a moment of like 18,000 or whatever the heck it is. Yeah. You're going to do this, you know, your weight times your arm is going to equal some number, uh, another number for the baggage, your fuel is another number, and then you're going to add up your moments. So your sum of your moments, and you're going to take the sum of your weights and you're going to get, so this is a uh, foot, uh, or sorry, correction, uh, pound times inches. Those are your units. Your weight is going to be in pounds. And so your pound inches divided by pounds, your pounds are going to cross out. The, again, the, the total moments divided by the total weights, the pounds will cross out and you'll be left with inches. And this is your center of gravity. Uh, this, is, this is literally the formula for finding your center of gravity. And so you're going to go into your pilot operating handbook. There's going to be a chart that says for this weight uh, and this, this over here, so your weight will be over here. Uh, for this weight, this is your min and maximum center of gravity. If your 
if your center of gravity is too far aft or too far forward, uh, it is unsafe to fly and you're out of, out of balance. You can also be overweight. Um, that's the other way that you could be wrong, essentially. So you have to find a way of configuring your aircraft, putting your pilot, passengers, baggage, uh, and fuel in a, in a configuration that puts you inside your safe envelope for your uh, weight and balance. Oh, okay. I was really confused about what it was asking. It's yeah. just a fancy average, isn't it? <laughs> like Pretty basically. much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, but people who aren't engineers or who, are, who don't like math, it might be you know difficult uh, to 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 do, but it's not that bad yeah. really once you get used to it. Yeah, I was just yeah. confused about where to find like the arms and everything. And so yeah, thanks yeah, a lot. That helped a lot. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks for asking the question, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week. Hopefully, with it, it we've got a lot of midterms this week. I think for most engineering students. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm inter interested to see how many people actually do the assignment yeah uh, I'm, I'm anticipating nobody so mm -hmm. i will i will have something in my back pocket mm -hmm. but uh i really hope somebody will come up with something so. All right. okay cool, man. thank you very Thanks much again. See, ya. see ya uh hey monty hey what's going on? Um, i'm here with anson i was just this is a really dumb question but we're just trying to clarify for the assignment sure um, so are we are we like we're using all our resources and are we picking our uh, picking like a um a starting point and an ending point or are we going like is there like a set mission that we were supposed to do or can we do we just pick like what we want whatever we want it's like a really yeah. definitely went over this already but yeah sure uh actually let me pull up the the briefing and it, it might make things easier um can you still see my screen okay yeah great <laughs> Okay, so basically, you are your start point is kind of up to you. Like, where are you heading out from? Uh, typically, we pick Payne because that's where our aircraft is stationed. But if you want to say, "Hey, my aircraft's in Renton" or whatever, that's fine too. Uh, okay. So if you, yeah, so here's the situation: there's a pilot flying with their spouse, and this is where you need to find them. This this is where you can expect to find the, the down pilot. Yeah, so the coordinates. So you need to go make a plan to get to those coordinates and do a ground reference maneuver or a series of ground reference maneuvers to search this area. And then uh, here's all the, the parameters, uh, your loadout. Um, yeah. Ask them where we find this. Okay, that sounds good. And then um, to find this document, uh, do you know how we can get our hands on that? Yeah, I'll sh I'm going to pull it up for you so you guys can see. And watch it not be there, right? <laughs> so if you go to, oh yeah, I'm on definitely wrong website here, Emerald Squadron Aviation. Yeah, dude, it's up. Almost done. Uh, is dinner ready? Check with mom. If if dinner's going on, I can we can oh, just no. mess about this later. No, it's no, it's totally cool. Totally cool. It's almost done. So if you go to the Husky Flying Club uh, program here, go to I want to say it's weather and navigation, the second to last module. I think it's in that one. If it's not in that one, it's going to be in week six. Yeah, here it is. So module 503, the, the fifth week, last day, there's, there's two mission briefs. You can pick Alpha or Bravo, and it'll come up, and it's everything that I've, you know, there. Does that make sense? Great. Yeah, that's great. Right, sounds good. Yeah, and there's an, there's an optional second one there, too, if you want to do it. Okay. Yeah, I used to I used to do them as like two ships, and it would be like a group thing, um, but I decided to go with the individualist one. So, 
All right. Sounds good. All right. Just needed to clarify that. That was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for asking. Thank you. See ya. See ya. See ya. All right. And I think that is.